So welcome to lesson 11, the Calvin cycle. And the Calvin cycle is a very important step in photosynthesis because yesterday we looked at the light dependent reactions where all the reactions in some way, shape or form relied on light in order to kind of power those reactions. When you think about anything in photosystem two and, and some of the aspects of photosystem one as well, the light dependent component, meaning that it's gonna be excited by a photon. So in some way, shape or form, that electron will gain energy from a photon to do the work that is needed in those photosystems and in the light dependent reactions. When we start to look at the Calvin cycle though, we're gonna look at the light independent reactions. Uh, it still needs the products from the light dependent reactions because these are gonna be very, very important uh, electron donors and electron receptors when it comes to that Calvin cycle. Uh, but it's very important to recognize that the Calvin cycle does not need light and that the reaction occur in the stroma, which is the aqueous fluid surrounding those thylakoids. So when we, thought, talk, when we talked about the thylakoids and when we talked about the stroma in terms of how hydrogens move in and out between those two things to kind of power that ATP synthase, we're now looking at what's happening inside the stroma. So everything was kind of going on in the lumen with some contribution from the stroma. But now we're looking at what's happening in the stroma with those light independent reactions. So recall that CO2 is fully oxidized. It contains little energy compared to other fuels. That it means it is going to be a low energy state. But the key thing you can think about carbon dioxide is that if it's reduced by NADPH to produce a carbohydrate, the overall process will be endergonic, right? Endergonic, and it will require lots of energy or not lots of energy, it will require energy in the form of ATP. So we're gonna spend energy here to turn that CO2, which has no energy, which has no energy in it, or little energy, I should say. We're gonna spend energy in the form of ATP, therefore making it an endergonic reaction. And that expenditure of energy will help us to reduce that CO2, utilizing NADPH, to produce carbohydrates. And the Calvin cycle is the process that we describe when we talk about that reduction. So the Calvin cycle is the most common pathway used to produce carbohydrates. Though some plants will have additional light dependent steps immediately after Calvin cycle, we'll look at those in the afternoon because there's gonna be some kind of alternatives uh, to the Calvin cycle, but also some things that work in conjunction with the Calvin cycle. So it's not just the, uh, it's not just the Calvin cycle that's responsible for that process. But again, we'll look at that in lesson 12. So how do we produce carbohydrates using the Calvin cycle? So let's take a look at this cycle and we're gonna answer the following questions with regards to that cycle. So I'll just clear up some stuff that we have going, oh, too much. Clear up some stuff that we have going on here. So examine the cycle and answer the following questions. Where do the ATP and NADPH come from? We looked at it yesterday when we looked at those light dependent reactions, right? Those light dependent reactions are gonna produce that ATP via ATP synthase the NADPH is gonna be produced as a result of those electron transport chains shuffling energy down that chain to not only produce, but to create that hydrogen ion uh, electronegativity gradient, but it's also going to help form that NADPH from that NADP plus. So why do we need an input of energy here? Why is there a necessary input of energy required for the Calvin cycle? Well, it's gonna be that we're storing that energy. We're storing that energy in the bonds of sugars for later use. And we'll, I'll constantly harken back to this and talk about this when we look at how much energy is spent during the Calvin cycle versus how much energy we can get from aerobic respiration, you'll see why plants undergo this process instead of just harnessing light directly for energy. We had that conversation come up yesterday a little bit where uh, someone asked the question, why don't they just turn the light directly into energy for use? because that sugar, that breakdown of glucose through aerobic respiration, it actually produces more ATP than you can from any light dependent reaction. So even though that light dependent reaction does form some ATP, it doesn't form as much as aerobic respiration. So why is this considered a cycle? Why do we call it the Calvin cycle? Well, we're gonna regenerate a starting material. We're gonna regenerate that starting material at the beginning, and we'll talk about how that regeneration is used for later uh, Calvin cycles. But the reason we're doing that is because just like anything in biology and in life in general, the recycling of material 
allows for an extraordinary efficiency that reduces waste and increases that efficiency we've talked about in many occasions to date. How many times must this cycle happen to produce one glucose molecule? This is like a cool little sticky situation in the sense that it needs to produce one glucose molecule in some way, shape or form. But how many times does it need to go through that? Well, twice. Okay, it's going to go through that twice. And we'll talk about what those two G3Ps are and how they are needed in order to make that one glucose molecule. So this is just the general overview of that cycle. Uh, we're going to talk more about it in detail as we move forward. But the general gist of it starts with three. There's three phases to it. The first phase is that fixation of carbon dioxide. We're going to then redu the reduction of that 3-phosphoglycerate or that to that G3P, which is a again, just that intermediate that we're going to talk about consistently. And then that G3P goes to phase three, and it is used for the regeneration of Rubisco from that G3P. But we're going to use some of it for that regeneration for later, and we're also going to use some of it to produce that glucose. It can also make other products as well, but the main focus of the Calvin cycle, as I've alluded to several times over today and yesterday, is to make that glucose. So let's take a look at our phases. The first phase is carbon fixation. Carbon fixation is looking at the conversion of inorganic carbon into an organic form, right? The, the C's and the O's are inorganic. So carbon dioxide is an inorganic molecule. And anything that has C, H, and O, those hydrocarbons, is considered an organic molecule. Those of you who took chemistry in grade 11, when you looked at organic chemistry and the differentiation between those two, you hopefully have a better appreciation for the idea of inorganic versus organic. Okay, so we're going to look at some specific steps in this reaction, just because I think it's important for us to understand the context of how carbon uh, is fixed, essentially, and for how the basic starting of that phase of the Calvin cycle uh, utilizes aspects that have been regenerated previously. So we talk about CO2 reacting with that ribulose 1,5-biphosphate, or I call it Rubisco, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So it's that 5-carbon sugar, and it's going to form a 6-carbon intermediate, which breaks into two 3-carbon molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate, or 3-PGA. So when we think about 3-PGA, when we think about 3PGA, again, we're always, always, always thinking in context of how does this compare, how does this process compare to aerobic respiration? And there are some similarities in terms of pyruvate and that 3PGA, so it's important for you to think about it in terms of those comparisons. So uh, this is called a C3 metabolism. There are other possibilities of that metabolism. We'll look at those in, in Lesson 12 the C4 metabolism, a CAM metabolism. We'll talk about what those mean, but that C3 means that it's turning that intermediate form that we're utilizing for later, it's turning it into a three carbon or C3 molecule. So we take that six carbon molecule and we break it down into a three carbon molecule and that's gonna be the end of that first phase. But the fixation happens, that carbon fixation happens when that CO2 is attached on, is when it's attached on to that ribulose 1,5-biphosphate or that Rubisco. There's no difference between C3 or 3C. It's just in plants, they describe it as a C3 metabolism as opposed to a 3C metabolism. It's just the way they've, they've organized it for whatever reason they've decided to do that for. So again, the first phase, the first phase, the big idea here is that we're utilizing something that's been rejuvenated, we're reusing something, that ribulose 1,5-biphosphate, we're adding a carbon onto it, and then breaking that carbon in half into two intermediates, or that 3-PGA. And that's why we call it that C3 metabolism. So this is the first phase of the Calvin cycle, complete. We have those two molecules of 3-PGA, those intermediate three carbon, um, those three carbon chains, and we're gonna look at utilizing those molecules next. So the enzyme Rubisco, which I, I alluded to earlier, 
is considered the most important and abundant protein on earth. And when you think about why that is the case, when you think about what exists in on mass on this planet, more than anything really and truly out there, uh, it's plants, right? And since it catalyzes the first reaction of the Calvin cycle for all photoautotrophs, that means that anything that utilizes photosynthesis in some way, shape or form to, like, to harness that light energy to make sugars for food storage, they will have to utilize the enzyme Rubisco. It is responsible for utilizing 100 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year and it provides sugar to every single organism on this planet with the exception of a few. So we are here today that it is, uh, we are here today because of Rubisco in some way, shapes and form. I mean, among other things, but we are here today because that Rubisco is able to fix that carbon to that one five uh, sugar molecule that we, we recycle with that one five rubo, oh, can't remember, can't speak the name, that one five ribulose by phosphate that gets recycled. So when we think about that importance of Rubisco, it's, it's incredibly important in any reaction that we have to consider both cellular respiration as well as photosynthesis. Um, it binds with O2 like half the time. Yeah, we'll talk about that afterwards. Um, but yes, it doesn't work. Again, like everything, theoretically it works perfectly. In, in practice, it doesn't always work and function that best of the way, but it is very good at what it does. So let's take a look at the reduction of 3B, 3PGA. So each molecule of that 3PGA has an inorganic phosphate molecule. When you scroll back up, take a look. It's got an inorganic phosphate molecule attached to it. That's because that ribulose 1,5 biphosphate, that ribulose 1,5 biphosphate that gets recycled, it has two inorganic phosphate groups attached to it as well. That's important because that was added through the hydrolysis of ATP. So when you start to think about how energy is utilized in this process, you start to recognize the, the telltale signs that ATP has been used and that inorganic phosphate attached to that 3PGA is a telltale sign of that. We're going to need that molecule for later. So this molecule is reduced by high energy electrons carried by, you guessed it, NADPH, that NADPH forming that, or uh, that ability that NADPH has to reduce those molecules because it carries that high energy electron is very important because it's going to help us to produce that G3P, which is the building block of all other compounds in the Calvin cycle. That glyceraldehyde three phosphate is the absolute most important building block for all the other compounds that we're gonna utilize from the Calvin cycle. So that's stage two where that 3PGA from stage one gets reduced by NADPH. We recognize that it has an inorganic phosphate molecule attached to it, and it ultimately produces the G3P, which is kind of like the base building block of all the compounds that we're going to talk about in this uh, final couple of lessons of this unit. So what happens to the oxidized NADP plus NADP? Well, it's going to return to that light-dependent reaction center. It's going to go back to that lumen and it's going to be recycled and reutilized for the production of ATP through ATP synthase in the lumen of the phthalocoids, as well as for the production of ATP through ATP synthase. So when it's reduced by NADPH, the remaining NADP is then put back in to the light dependent reaction portion of that chloroplast. So yes, it does get sent back into the area of that thylakoid membrane or in the lumen specifically to allow for that reaction to then get catalyzed again. Lastly, we look at the regeneration of that RUBP, right? That 1,5-ribulose uh, biphosphate, because again, that is going to be the component that is consistently reused and recycled in this Calvin cycle. So some of those G3Ps, five to be exact, five of those G3Ps are sent back through that cycle. They're combined and rearranged into that RUBP, which is needed to start the whole cycle again because RUBP is catalyzed by Rubisco when it reacts with CO2 to restart that entire cycle again. So again, you can really start to see the similarities from some things in aerobic respiration where we have a cyclical cycle that consistently utilizes a regenerated thing, that RUBP, to 
carry on that cycle. So it's interesting because it, it's, it's only using one sixth of the product to make sugar because it's always going to have some in reserve, so to speak, but it's enough to form the glucose required for all the cellular processes in, in, uh, in the plants. So let's take a look at the overall summary of these reactions because there's quite a bit to talk about in terms of the general idea. So the cycle must happen one time with three CO2 molecules to produce one molecule of G3P. So that one molecule of G3P essentially is half the amount required for glucose because glucose is C6H12O6. So G3P only has three carbons in it. So that means that we're gonna need to go through the entire cycle, that entire cycle two times because it spits out one G3P every single cycle, okay? Every single cycle, it spits out one G3P and we need two G3Ps to perform or to create one glucose molecule. So one cycle happens with three CO2 molecules to produce one G3P. Glucose, which has six carbons, needs a cycle to go through twice in order to create one glucose molecule from the G3Ps produced by the Calvin cycle. So now we're gonna look at some net productions and net inputs and net gains of glucose produced by the Calvin cycle. So we are gonna have to put in six CO2s, 18 ATP, and 12 NADPH. Now recall, yesterday when I talked about this, I said, we need more ATP we need more ATP than we do NADPH. And it's a three to two ratio. I was wrong on the, the three to one ratio. It's a three to two ratio, so my apologies. But we need more ATP than we do need NADPH. That six CO2, right? Think about that balanced chemical equation aspect of, of our uh, photosynthetic reaction, right? It's gonna have six carbons that go into the cycle and we utilize those six carbons to form one molecule of glucose. The ATP and NADPH, those are those energy stored in the, in the bonds of that G3P and eventually those sugars. It takes all of that electron reducing ability of the NADPH, all of that stored phosphate energy of those ATP bonds, and it's gonna take 18 and 12 of each of those to store it, all that energy into that glucose molecule. And again, remember this cyclic electron transport cycle that we talked about yesterday. Sometimes we need more ATP than NADPH. So sometimes it goes through that cyclic electron transport cycle to make more ATP because we need that three to two ratio of ATP to NADPH. Oops. So it's always going to be producing the same thing. It's always gonna be producing the same thing in terms of the Calvin cycle will always make that G3P and then that G3P will then get converted into glucose. And the products are always going to be, I don't have it here, I think it's towards the end, um, but recall that the products of photosynthesis, it's always going to be sugar and it's always going to be oxygen, okay? That, those are the products of photosynthesis. We're looking at it in the grand scheme of things only because we don't go into too much detail after the, the Calvin cycle in terms of, of the steps that are required to produce that sugar from those two G3Ps. Just know that in photosynthesis, in photosynthesis, the overall chemical equation. So plant products, when we look at plant products, G3P is the building block for all organic molecules the plants need to synthesize, okay? It is the absolute building block for all things that plants need to synthesize. Sugars, sucrose, cellulose, fats, proteins, what have you. We'll talk more about how this process works when we look at how sugars can be uh, converted into cellulose and fats and proteins with regard to DNA as well as homeostasis. Those two units, we look at the conversion of sugar into necessary and needed components to go through neg regular uh, cellular respir or sorry, regu regular cellular processes. Uh, the reaction used to build these complex polymers are essentially the reverse of glycolysis, right? I, I, I've stated this probably a million times. Um, the, they are essentially a reverse they're essentially a reverse of glycolysis. Now, does that mean it's a one-to-one -one reverse? No, there are some differences, but the big idea, right? The big idea is that photosynthesis and glycolysis are kind of reverses of each other's or cellular respiration 
and photosynthesis are generally reverses of each other. So when we talk about this reaction used to build these sugars as essentially the reverse of or glycolysis, which is breaking down that sugar at the start, but they can happen in different areas of the plant cell, right? G3P is actually not restricted to chloroplast. And, and we don't get into too much detail with regards to that, but ultimately that many of those reactions to form those sugars happen in the cytoplasm of the cell itself. But again, we're just looking at the big idea of the Calvin cycle and what its goal is based off of what it utilizes in terms of carbon, ATP and NADPH with the goal of performing photosynthesis to produce sugar and oxygen. Okay, folks, that's it for the lesson this morning. Uh, it is hopefully not too uh, labor intensive. I've got some questions for you to take a look at with section 5.2. There's also an activity, I think, in the folder for you to take a look at with regards uh, to the topic of it, the title itself in terms of the Calvin cycle. So I encourage you to please take a look at both of those things as you practice and get ready for the quiz this afternoon. And you also have some time to work on your summative pretty much effectively for the rest of the morning, right? Because when you look at the schedule, we just have Calvin cycle this morning, the practice and the questions that you have to work on for the Calvin cycle. And I'm giving you the work period next period to work on that summative assignment, right? There should be no reason why that culminating assignment can't get finished on time on Friday because I'm giving you time in class right now to work on it, okay? So I'm gonna end recording here and I will be more than happy to answer questions as they come.